Okay, so uh, we are on our on the way to doing something with this data. We've captured, we've written the code to capture the first name and the last name. And the syntax is exactly the same, creating another object, var. So another variable with some name, well, val, the value of the input field of last name, set it equal to document object get an element by its ID, the element with in last name. Give me the property value, whatever the person typed into that box. And then it's the same here as before, console.log val in last name, and the end result in the browser is that now you type in a name, you press go, and it's got the first name and the last name. Great. The name is still there. When we had the default behavior, you might have noticed you typed in a name, you pressed go, the name disappeared, it cleared itself out. We prevented that default behavior because the default behavior was a refresh. We oftentimes nowadays need to prevent the default behavior, so that's why we've got line 46. But now it's preventing the real behavior that I want of it clearing those fields. We can, we can clear the fields without refreshing the screen. So next line here. We need to reference the name of the form. What is the name of the form as, an, as a JavaScript object? L form user. That's an object. Dot reset method. Invoke the reset method of the L form user object. So now in sequence, capture the names, display the names in the console, reset the form, empty out the form, not refresh the whole screen simply empty the form. So this would be listed somewhere in the page here when it talks about using forms and it would tell you use this method to do this action. You don't have to have them all memorized but you need to be able to look them up or have a good book. This is a very common thing to do here then Let's reset the form. So now when I test it, I have a name, I click go or press enter. It does what it did before and then it also clears it for me. I can start typing, I can click cancel, it clears it. I can type something, enter, capture the name, clear the fields. So what I want to do with this is I want it to, so we're getting input and we're storing it in a variable, in an object. I want to process that and then output it to the user. Something simple, I want it to say, welcome, John Smith. I want it to know who signed in and say that name. So there's several ways to do this. Here's one way. We're going to process the name. We need to combine the name together. So we could have been asking for, you know, first name and last name in one box. But I want to separate it into multiple boxes because we could do different things. For example, I wanted to say, welcome, Smith, comma, Victor. I want to display the name in, in a different way. So I'm going to process this by combining those names. After we reset the form, we'll create another variable. We'll call this uh, first last equals. Now, for the moment, we're going to write something. But I'll just put a placeholder. I want to make another variable to, to then store or process the name, last name first. The, point, the purpose of this one is to have the name combined as first name, then last name. 
let's just be more obvious. First, last name. It's going to be the first name and the last name combined as one. And I also want then a last name and a first name combined. So I would create a variable. But a shorthand is instead of semicolon, you can put a comma and then define the next one without having to say that var keyword again. It's not a big deal to write var again like we did twice up there. But this is very common and more efficient. Define one variable, one object, comma, and then define another one, end of statement. Or comma, define another one, age is equal to whatever, comma, and define another one, high score, don't write this, equal to something else, and then semicolon, end of statement. So this is more efficient. That's three bytes of data. 3 plus 3 plus 3, that's 9 extra bytes we saved doing it this way. And all of those little bytes add up in the long term. This is very common to do, except notice the syntax is a little different. Commas at the end of each definition until the final one. So a shortcut. Create more than one variable with a comma at the end until the final one with a semicolon. Okay, so I want to combine the first name and the last name together for my first variable and then the last name and the first name. So instead of this placeholder, we're going to reference the first name, val in first name, space plus val in last name. What we're doing here is very fancy term, string concatenation, aka combining words. There's a word that is stored in this object and another word in this object. Plus symbol is string concatenation. We're combining them together because in uh, most programming languages, 1 plus 1 might equal 2, or 1 plus 1 might equal 11. We'll see why in a moment. So this is string concatenation, and then we'll do it the other way. Val in last name plus val in first name. Create a variable, create an object where we've combined the last name plus the first name. To see all of our hard work in the console, we haven't put it to the screen yet, console log, and then we can say first, last, first, last name, comma, last, first name. We're doing console output like we've always done, and we could have done two. But this again, here's our comma. Like this comma was used when we created the variable. Start this command, comma, do another one. Start this command, comma, do another one. Do another console output. It's kind of like looking at it like this, I guess. What we're saying in the console, write the first last name variable and then, comma, write the last name, first name variable. Save it, type a name, click go, check your console. You should see a couple of things. One of them is this that we expect, and something that we don't.
So let me test this out. I'm going to save it and run it. I'll open my console as soon as possible. I'm going to type a name. Go. So it's got right there line 71. It wrote Luke Locker, and then the second output, Skywalker Luke. This is the part that reminds you that computers are dumb. I expected Luke space Skywalker. Or maybe I expected Skywalker comma Luke. No, it gave us exactly what we told it, because the computer is dumb and we didn't tell it exactly what we wanted. So I want to create a space in between the first name and the last name, and I want to add a, a comma in between the last name first name version. So we need more string concatenation. We need to combine more words. Even empty spaces need to be explicitly mentioned for it to do what, I, what I'm envisioning. So we have to do this. Val in first name plus, quote, space, quote, space, plus. Display the first name, display an empty space, display the last name. Something plus something plus something. Luke plus space plus Skywalker. For the, for the other one, it's the same sort of idea. So I would do it like this before I have to fill in what I need to fill in. This is, again, the part that it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget this plus here, and then it breaks. So I, I wrote what I'm... Eventually, I'm going to put something here. I've got something plus something plus something. So I wrote it first, and then the something is going to be this, right? Right. Nope, I need a space also. Something, comma, no space, something. Something, comma, space, something. So now it will display the last name, or now it should display the last name, plus a comma, plus a space, plus the first name. Is Han Solo's last name Solo? <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? I'm thinking too hard. There we go. Han Solo. Solo Han. This is starting to look a little bit jumbled here. I can also do string concatenation in the console. I can say, welcome space plus so we'll say the words welcome plus the space and then the first and last name welcome on solo so the string I'm combining it <coughs> with the value inside the variable Now there's this string literal, this static data that displays along with this dynamic data of Han Solo. And then the rest comes out here because I didn't fully define it. But we're we're doing string concatenation. We're combining words, empty sim, empty spaces, exclamation points, because technically an empty space is not nothing. It is deep in the computer, it's still code. It's ASCII character 32, I believe. It is a, it is a code that 
it's just invisible, but it is something. It takes space. So I have to write an empty space here. The rest of this output I don't know, we could say something like uh, saving user record colon space. If we don't put that space, and it's not an error, it's not a coding error, but it is a you know design error. I've got this space that doesn't look good. Saving user record. Usually you'd have a space after a colon. And I didn't write it there. So no space. So then here, dynamic data that changes, static data that doesn't. Welcome land of Kalmyzian, saving user record. And so the name is, is backwards in that way. All of this that we've been doing has been outputting to the console. We're going to start to output to the screen in a moment. Let me pause here. Are you getting, are you getting some console output? Does it make sense about concatenation? We're building a stream. We're building output. Dynamic data plus static data plus dynamic data. And we need a little help. Last time when we output to the screen, we used document.write. And that actually can be dangerous, because we're saying, to the document, let's write something. Depending how we write that, we could accidentally erase everything on the screen and only write what we said document.write. A safer way is let's write output to a specific place on the screen document is the whole screen. So we have to be careful. We might overwrite the whole screen by using document.write. So we want to have a placeholder on screen to then write output. We have a tag, an HTML tag, that is basically a placeholder. It's called div. We have a tag. We have a tag that can be a placeholder to write our output. Let's go back to our HTML area outside of the script area. We're going to create a div tag, div, div for division. If you back up, way back up here, after the form, this isn't actually form content, so after the form, we've got a div that's Got nothing there. This is commonly used as a placeholder. Now we're back in HTML, so we want to use the HTML comment. Div tag, often used as a placeholder. We'll display dynamic data. So that's, that's back here, uh, an HTML comment, so remember, it's, a, it's an exclamation point syntax, and it ends that uh, way. Uh, so this placeholder, we're going to use that to display the stuff we've been putting to the console. Now, uh, this has no unique identifier, so we should give it an ID attribute, call it div. Um, div results. 
it's a placeholder, it has a unique ID, call it whatever you want, you can call it you know, kitty cat and this will work. You just have to reference kitty cat properly and it will work. So this is something we're making up. IDs, we usually make these up ourselves and any functions we make them up. So whatever you want to call them, maybe make them make sense. Div uh, results. So we don't ha we don't really have to write anything here because it's going to be replaced by what our code does down here. We're going to write into this div. Uh, so you can leave it empty. When when I talk about efficiency and all of that, what's more efficient is if we just keep this on one line. That saves a few bytes as well. That's a little bit less to process. It's a little more efficient. Yeah, it's two bytes, but if you save these shortcuts every everywhere that you can, that stuff adds up. Even an empty space or an enter is a byte of data. You add up these bytes, you get kilobytes and megabytes of wasted space and processing power. So you can leave it as is, how I had it here, empty spaces, but I would, if I was doing this myself, I would leave it like this. The problem here is that it's uh, easy to lose track of that you did close the div, because usually we have the closing tag on its own line, oftentimes, and here at a glance you might not see that you did close it, because you didn't see it on the next line. So in that placeholder, we're going to write these names. We'll go back to where we left off in the JavaScript. After that part... Okay, we had document.write previously. That won't work now because now we have an object uh, we have a new object to deal with, that div. What will work is what we've done before about creating a variable, referencing a certain ID, and then something else. So um, we could create a, a brand new variable right here to reference the uh, that object. And I haven't covered it at the moment. It's not super important to cover it just yet. But let me touch on it, and then it'll be more important later. You see that... Uh, that um, Outside of the function save name, we created a variable that referenced the whole form. We then used that object later on to invoke submission of the form. We've got a variable created outside of a function. We created a few variables here then inside of this function. So we have to write a note up here saying global scope variable can be used anywhere in the program. If you create this variable outside of a function, any function can use it. If you create a variable in a function, it can only be used in that function. So variables outside of a function, but not outside of your main ify. Every, all of this code that we always will write in the class will always be in the ify. So that's a special case. But this variable can be used anywhere in our app, as opposed to the ones down here that can only be used in this function. That's called local scope variable. Local scope variable can only be used in this function. Function save name. So if I wanted to use the, if I had another function that was called high score. One function is to save the name, another function is to save the high score. In 
in, in function save high score, if I'm trying to access the person's name, I won't be able to. It will give me an error because that variable is only only exists is only used and only exists while this function is running. When this function finishes running, that variable disappears. It has this sort of garbage collection built in. These variables, this memory is freed up. As soon as function save name is finished, when we get to this curly brace here, these variables disappear. So it might not really matter too much to create a variable right in this function to access that div, or it might matter a lot. I'll take it in the in the in the case about it, it might matter a lot because I might want to reference that div lots of times. I might want to put there the person's name and later on a high score and all of that. So in this case it would be better to define an object of that div outside of the function name function. I already started to create L form user, end of statement, change that to a comma, L div results, document dot get element by ID, then end of statement, quotes div results. Be careful here. I took away the semicolon from the previous line and I put a comma so I can borrow the var uh, command to create another object based on the div I just created in quotes. Now I can use that object in this function or anywhere else in my code. I can't always tell you this I can't always tell you do it this way. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, are you trying to reference an object in the HTML many times? It's often safer then to create the variable outside of any function. I don't, maybe I don't need the first name and last name uh, except for very specific purposes, so it might be okay to create it in that function of save name. Okay, so if I created the shortcut of LDiv results, I can use that as the shortcut to write to that object. Add document.write, which might write all over the screen. Now I want to write something only to that div. LDiv results. So if you go back down here, console log this time ldiv results dot inner html not dot write um, that worked for the specific object of the document this is a different object we created this div it's different so uh, must use inner HTML and notice the capitalization. HTML is completely capitalized. Inner is lowercase. Must use inner HTML method if you create your own div object. There is a couple of other methods that you could use, such as text content. But uh, we'll look at this one first. So you have to use inner HTML when you create your own <coughs> elements when you're going to write something on screen. Let's use inner HTML element if you create your own div and you want to write something on screen. What's also different here than when we saw document.write, um, oops, I wrote something wrong here, uh, must use inner HTML property. It will not be a method, sorry. Um, it's a method 
with parentheses. This won't use parentheses, it'll use an equal. First, last name. This is a case where I've got an object, a div. Inside of that object, I want to write some HTML. What I want to write into that object is whatever is currently stored in the first last name variable, based on what the person typed. So this is again, the equals here. Take the thing on the right and put it into the thing on the left, like we had over here. Take the, la the first name and the last name and put it into the thing on the left. So, uh, if I open, if I run it in the browser, put my name, press enter, or go, the console output still works like before, but now on screen, it's outputting to that invisible div what I wrote in first last name inside of that inside of that div. So I've set the property of that div to this, inner HTML. I can write HTML here. In quotes, plus, I can write h2. I need to end the, the h2, so plus, quotes, brackets, slash h2. So I'm writing valid HTML here, which will be processed, basically, into that div. Start the h2 tag. It has to be in quotes. If I don't write it in quotes, the JavaScript block will think it's, H it's JavaScript. It's not JavaScript. It's HTML. So you write it in quotes write the h2 tag, and then write whatever is in that object, and then write more HTML. All of that, that, get, all of that then gets processed and put into the div, and the result is that your name appears big, because h2 is a heading, number 2, and it's, it's written as such. write any valid HTML here. You know, we could write a paragraph. We can write an A tag link. The one tricky part here is if I'm going to make this, what, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to make an active link in a paragraph, make a link on the person's name. Before href, we have the attribute of href and we'd write the quotes. The problem here would be this is going to break the, the JavaScript because I got an opening quote and I had an ending quote. But actually, I got an opening quote and an ending quote, nothing opening quote, ending quote, is going to confuse it. So here's the case where I would write the single quotes. 
because the JavaScript is going to scan and get to the double quote and it's going to look for its pair of ending double quotes. It's going to go here, skip that, and it finds it there. So that is complete. Then, because I'm using a different quote, I'm getting to this point, href equals single quote, single quote, and that's where I can write the address. If you have double quotes here, let's say I put it back to double quotes, it'll be more obvious now. Opening quote, scanning and scanning, double quote end. So that ended. And you've got gibberish. This is not a valid JavaScript command. And then a quote and a quote. Where's the plus? It's going to give you error messages here. And that, that quote here, that's meaning like a comment. So this is a very common mistake. When you have to have quotes inside of quotes, this is when you have to use the other kind of quote. I also see people doing these back ticks, which is at the top left corner of the keyboard below the escape on the Enya key. <coughs> So even these quotes do matter. Uppercase matters, spacing matters, quotes matter. We've been doing double quotes all of this time, and then now here's a special case where I need to combine both, or else I would break my string. I'm just kind of freestyling here a little bit. Output a paragraph, a tag with a link, close the a tag, Close the B tag. There's a string plus dynamic data plus a string. All of the all of that gets processed when I do inner HTML. And on screen. Name appears, active link, click, and it goes to the website. So I'm throwing this in because this is common and this is uh, something useful in that JavaScript, again, it can do all of this processing and such of JavaScript, but it can also read and manipulate HTML. It can create HTML. We didn't even touch CSS, but we can write some CSS. Uh, we can write some JavaScript to affect the CSS of, of HTML. It can do it all. And that's the good and the bad, that it's good that it's very powerful, it can do it all, but it's the bad, it's I've got to learn all of the syntax. The JavaScript syntax for CSS is different than the HTML syntax for CSS. Do one more thing that we'll get to uh, lab time. Um, this form that we're creating, technically at the moment, I can fill in a first name, but not a last name, and it'll take it. I want both fields to be required. So we have an attribute that we can activate for these inputs that will make it required. This is back on the HTML. If you back up to the HTML block, we have that input field of the first name, last name, these attributes, so type, name, placeholder, ID, I want to add a new one. Again, I like to leave ID as the very last one. 
example. So I'll add a new one here. Required. This is a special case. Sometimes you see it as required equals required. Too much writing. So we'll leave it as required. Now both of those fields are required. Now try to run it. Try to submit empty fields and the browser will tell you those are required. Chrome and Firefox behave a little bit differently. But adding a required attribute helps you uh, <coughs> helps you do a little validation, making sure that they're both filled in. refresh that and click go, please fill out this field. In the old days, you know, the ancient times, four years ago, you'd have to write a lot of JavaScript to get that to work. Now it's built in to the more modern, the more modern browsers will understand this. We've got modern updated versions of these browsers. Yes, there's some browsers that won't understand this. We've got Firefox 53. Firefox 4.0 doesn't understand this. Firefox 4.0 is from like seven years ago. So if you've taken other classes and they talk about, you know, progressive enhancement and they talk about fallbacks and all of that, there is a case for all of that that we'll talk about later. But when we're dealing with apps, eventually this project, these projects are going to go on devices. The reason we have these fallbacks on these older browsers is because there's older browsers. There's no such thing as Firefox 3.0 on a phone. There's no <coughs> such thing as you know Google Chrome 1.0 on a phone. There's no such thing as Internet Explorer on a phone. So oftentimes when we create this extra code to target all these possibilities of browsers and such, well, eventually we're going to a device. And these devices, they often are pretty modern. You know, you go to bed, you wake up, and it says you've got an update. So if you've taken other classes where we talk about fallbacks and all of that, I'm not going to worry about it just yet. If you don't know what I'm talking about it, you didn't hear anything. <laughs> just setting these properties required and such will let you uh, do some validation. Uh, okay, great. It's, uh, it's going to accept, it's going to force me to fill something. Let me fill something. It took it. I put empty spaces, and it took it, and there's my name. It's empty, but it's right there. Okay, well, what if I do this? What if I'm Yosemite Sam? It took that. So this is a different kind of issue. This, there's no problem here. There's no error. This is about data validation. So I put required, and it forces something to be written. What I want to be written is regular letters. Um, you know, regular letters. But, you know, you, you have names that have dashes, hyphenates. You have, you know, that's a valid name. I want to take that. You've got names, you know, if I had a hyphenated name or if I had a senior or whatever, do I want to exclude the comma and the period and all of that? So there's more validation that could be done, and this is when it does get more complex to check what are the valid inputs. You know, what if I try to do this? So it took it, it was code, it looked weird, it didn't process it, that's good, but sometimes this is how sites get hacked. When people put in, they try to put in code into a form, a form that is not properly validated, that code may run, that code may execute on the server, and then you've hacked the site. So data validation is an important thing we're going to cover in more detail, but if you want to have some homework over the weekend,
if you want to have some more homework, you can do this. You can go to, let's see, what's the address again? You can go to developer.mozilla.org. It's in the syllabus, I believe. Developer.mozilla.org. So Mozilla, the people behind the Firefox web browser, if you don't know their history, they are one of the most important organizations out there. Not just because they have the Firefox web browser, but because they're one of the one of like the founding members of the of the web. They uh, developed the early web browsers that really popularized the, the the World Wide Web. Anyone remember using Netscape Navigator back in the day? Netscape Navigator came from the company Netscape, which eventually evolved into Mozilla, which is now Firefox. Netscape also was involved in creating JavaScript. So back in 1994, uh, uh, an employee in Netscape put out their version of uh, this language called JavaScript. It was called something else before that. And they uh, put it out there and uh, they said, well, this hot new cool language Java just came out. Let's piggyback on them and borrow the name. So they created JavaScript. And the confusion is that the code in Java is completely different than the code in JavaScript, but they both share that root name. So Mozilla, they're important because they have a, a, a lot of uh, cachet in the history of the, of the web, but they are an amazing resource of references and guides about learning all of this stuff and looking up all of this stuff. And basically they are one of the guides of these languages. So if I wanted to look up how do I write JavaScript to do X, Y, and Z? They often have a very good tutorial or reference for how to do it. What I'm getting at is if you wanted to do further validation of this form, there is code that we can write that you can look up here on how to only accept certain characters, how to exclude exclamation points, and that sort of thing. It's, uh, you just have to look it up under reference, HTML. By the way, JavaScript is originally called LiveScript. LiveScript, that's what it was. Yeah, Mocha. Mocha. Yeah, the so it evolved, yeah, Java, Mocha, Coffee, CoffeeScript, all of that. Someone drank a lot, I guess. So, um, of course, and there was no Red Bull yet. <laughs> input validation. So I'm just showing you here, there are going to be, okay, so here's here's the full details about, I want to create an input form that will only accept numbers. This will give you a huge article with all of the bloody details. It's a big article just about numbers, a form that will only accept numbers. Examples, defaults that are built in, see they're using the ID in the wrong place type examples you can go open up a live example and code it right there and test it out but in here you will find the reference about how do I set it up so that only it accepts the letters A through Z and the symbols dash comma and period we won't do it right now because it's a little bit more effort than I want to do but <coughs> I'm going to show you this is one of the items in the syllabus and one of the best places for you to look up this stuff because it's really one of the most official places where you can get all of this info on HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Google has their own one too. I think it's simply developer.chrome.com and they have their own version of these docs as well. Um, somewhere, we'll find it. But developer.mozilla Dot org is your homework, your unofficial homework. Go to that website, poke around there, look what's there, and it's a great reference. So this code, if it worked, great. If not, we'll do a little lab time until 9.30. I'm going to put my code up to this point. Raise your hand if it kind of worked like, uh, like mine worked. Okay, great. Now take your hand and pat yourself on the back. You are a web developer. HTML. JavaScript. We didn't do CSS, but it's in there. You're a web developer. So that's it for the moment.